Hey everybody, I do trust and pray that you're all doing well. I know that God has caused his face to shine upon us and for that we thank him for his grace and for his mercy. Uh, today I want to look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, along with Psalms 8. All right, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, along with Psalms 8. Let us bow in a quick moment of prayer and then we'll dive into the word for the day. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We magnify you for your transcendence and your remnants. We ask you now, God, that you open up our hearts to be able to receive your word, open up our minds to be able to understand your word, and give us divine clarity and divine instruction for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. Uh, the Bible records uh, from the King James Version. Uh, it says, if I can get there, it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Psalm 8, the psalmist picks up his pen uh, and he writes in verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So I must ask this question, what is Man, and that's the same question that I want to lift up today. What is man? What is man? As we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, in the original Hebrew, it says, man came to be, right? came into being uh, after the image and the likeness of God, after the image and the likeness of the aseity of God. He came into being. Uh, Genesis is a uh, fascinating book. Uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis in particular uh, has faced uh, public scrutiny. It has uh, been argued in the halls of academia uh, for centuries upon centuries. There uh, has been varying agendas throughout history uh, to try to discredit uh, the authenticity of Genesis, and in particular, Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, they've been trying to discredit the authenticity of its historical value and the merit of of its historicity. Uh, Genesis 1 uh, through 2 records the creation of all things. Uh, Genesis 3 through 5 records the corruption of all things, uh, which details the first sin of man uh, through Adam in the Garden of Eden. And it goes through uh, to his son Cain and it records the murder a brother in the fields. Uh, Genesis 6 through 9 records the condemnation of all things as God sends judgment in the form of a historic flood. Uh, 
Genesis 10 and 11 then records the confusion of all things as man began to honor themselves more than they honored the creator, right? They began to honor the creature over the creator, right? So Genesis 1 through 2 uh, records the creation of all things. Genesis 3 through 5 records the corruption of all things. Genesis 6 through 9 records the condemnation of all things. And Genesis 10 and 11 records the confusion of all things as men begin to honor themselves more than they honored God. Men begin to honor the creature more than they began to honor the creator. Uh, Genesis uh, is wonderful. I love the book of Genesis because it gives us a sneak peek into that day in which God steps out of nothing. <laughs> and when he steps out of nothing, he steps into something because he's there. He speaks and things come to be. Uh, gives us a sneak peek, a glimpse into uh, the infinite wisdom of God as he steps out of the uncreated nothingness and speaks. <laughs> and when God begins to speak, things began to move that wasn't even in existence. Notice the power of God. I know what the question is. The question is, what is man? But before we get to what is man, we have to notice the power of God, right? Because we're created in the image of God. And so we have to look at God first and notice the power of God that as he steps out of the uncreated nothingness, he speaks and things move that wasn't even in existence yet. <laughs> when God speaks, things that are not even in existence begins to move. He speaks and it cuts through the silence. Sound waves of his voice cuts through the darkness that was upon the face of the deep, the face of the Tehoam, the face of the chaotic form of mass that the earth was at that time. He speaks out, and those things at the risk of repeating that were not in existence had to obey the voice of God. God speaks and things that are not in existence had to obey the voice of God and come from non-existence into existence. It is here when God speaks where space, time, and matter come into existence. He commands the spaceless, timeless, and immaterial to come into existence. We begin to behold the creation of God in Genesis chapter 1. We see the splendor of the sun. We see the magnificence of the moon. We see the brilliancy of the stars. We see the beauty of nature in its most pure sense and rare, rarest form. We see uh, the beauty of God as he speaks and, and things begin to move, things begin to sprout up in the earth. We see uh, the, the earth, uh, that, that, or the clouds rather, the sky, the blue skies that knows no rain at this time, that is home to the birds and the fowl of the air, where it has made their habitation. Uh, we see uh, the vastness of the ocean that is, the residence of marine life from the from the great blue whale to the smallest of the fish. We see the, the green carpet of grass that is walked upon by the elephant, and walked upon and roamed upon by the lion. We see all of this beauty, all of this splendor, the birds in the air, the bees, and, uh, the flowers that bloom, the trees that have grown tall. We see all of this beauty, all of its splendor, but yet creation is still not complete. Creation 
is not complete. Despite the mountains that have been formed, despite the craters that have been formed in the earth, despite the valleys that have been gorged out and dug deep into the earth, creation is still not complete until God looks at himself and starts talking. <laughs> creation is not complete until God speaks to himself and says, let us make man. My, my. Let us make man. Notice, uh, for everything else that God creates, for everything else that God forms or that God makes, he speaks to its habitation, right? For everything else that God makes, he speaks to the habitation and from its habitation, it comes forth, right? When he created the fish of the sea, he speaks to the ocean. And when he speaks to the ocean, the fish of the sea begins to form in the ocean. When he created the animals on the earth, he speaks to the earth. And from the earth, the animals come forth. But when he gets to man, he doesn't speak to the earth. He doesn't speak to the water. He doesn't speak to the firmament in the air. He speaks to himself. <laughs> he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He speaks to the habitation of everything else. And now he speaks to himself and said, let us make man. What does that tell us? It tells us that man's habitation is not of the water. Man's habitation is not of the air. Man's habitation is not even of the earth. <laughs> Man's habitation is from God, right? Our habitation is from God. Notice, he speaks to the air to bring forth the fowls of the air. He speaks to the water to bring forth the fish because that's their habitation. He speaks to the earth to bring forth the land animals because that's their habitation. But he doesn't speak to the air for man. He doesn't speak to the water for man. He doesn't speak to the earth for man. He speaks to himself because the habitation of man is in God. We reside in the bosom of God. We are, you hear this phrase all the time, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are not of this earth. We are of and produced from the spirit of God, from the loins of God. That is our habitation. That is why our soul longs to be with God. Our soul longs and thirsts after God. The psalmist says, as the deer panteth for the water brooks so my soul longs for thee O god because our spirit and our soul recognize that our habitation is not of the earth our habitation comes from the loins of god and that is why we are at war i'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit but that is why man is at war with himself because uh, we, our spirit, our soul recognizes the connection and the yearning to be with God because our habitation, our spirit's habitation is of God. But we're also <laughs> made and formed from the dust of the earth. Our flesh takes its form from the dust of the earth. And so our flesh seeks to hold on to the things of the world. But we have to be careful to not usurp, to, ha to have our flesh usurp the authority over our spirit. Because the habitation of being with God far supersedes our earthly habitation. So God looks at himself and looks at himself and begins to talk to himself. He speaks to himself and said, let us make man. No other creature in creation has the privilege that we have to say that God looked at himself, spoke to himself and said, let us make man. 
this this is why the psalmist picks up his pen in the Psalm 8 and says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you've crowned him with, with glory and honor, that the son of man that you visited him, that you crowned him with glory and with honor. What is man that you are mindful of him? God, who am I that you look down on me with love and compassion? God, who am I that you see, look beyond my faults and see every one of my needs? God, who are we? that you see us as the apple of your eye, the jewel of your crown. Who are we that you have made us Lord, if you will, over your creation? Who is Adam that you created him in the image and the likeness of you? Who is this man? Adam. What is man? That, that word Adam in Hebrew, Adama means earth man. Adam is considered by many theologians as the highlight of God's creation. Right? So, so look at all look at all that God creates. Look at what God creates. And Adam is seen as the highlight of God's creation. Sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the planets, everything that God creates, the, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the trees that sprout up. But all of this succumbs to the value that is seen in Adam. Adam is seen as the highlight of God's creation. It has been estimated that uh, the most brilliant genius uses only one tenth of one percent of his total brain potential. Let me say it again. It has been estimated uh, that the most brilliant genius uses about one tenth of one percent of his total brain potential. All right. Adam, in his sinless state, could use his entire brain ability. Did you hear me? The, a genius can only use one-tenth of one percent of his total brain ability. But Adam, in his creation state, in his sinless state, could use 100% of his brain's ability. This means that Adam in his sinless state was at least 1,000 times superior to today's intellectuals. 1,000 times superior to today's intellectuals. Understand, we are probably 95% blind to the total color spectrum and color scheme that's displayed by nature. 95% blind to the total color scheme, to the total color spectrum that is available to us in nature. We are probably 98% deaf to all of nature's sounds. But Adam's Five senses were tuned to absolute perfection. Adam could hear every sound. Adam could see every color that we are 95% blind to. Adam could hear things that we are 98% deaf to. His senses were tuned to absolute perfection perfection. Adam perfectly understood both himself and his environment. 
which is why God trusted him to watch over his creation. If Adam was not perfect in every sense of the word, then God would have never trusted him to watch over his creation. Hallelujah. <laughs> Adam was created perfectly. And I don't I don't I didn't come to deal with this today, which is why I don't think he made a mistake in eating of the fruit. I believe Adam was calculated in eating of the fruit and that's that's a whole another sermon. Adam, he is the only creature that perfectly understands both himself and his environment. He's the only creature that is created in the image of God with the highest form of life. Adam is created in the image of God with the highest form of life. Let me say it again. Adam is the only creature that is created in the image of God with the highest form of life. Image of God. Imago Dei. That is a theological term uh, that describes, uh, that defines rather uh, made in the image of God, created in the image of God. Imago Dei. Uh, Adam was Imago Dei, created, made in the image of God. And after the likeness of God. And he possessed the highest form of life. Plant life possesses what we call unconscious life. Plants are living, but they are unconscious. Animals possess conscious life. They're living, they are aware of, this, of their surroundings, and their natural instincts kick in uh, for flight or fear, uh, prey and predator. So animals are conscious and aware of their surroundings. But man alone possesses a self-conscious life. Not only are we aware of what's around us, but we are aware of what's within us internally. Okay, man possesses a self-conscious life. Man was declared king over creation, commanded to subdue the earth, name the animals, and to care for his home in Eden's garden. All of this is a direct effect from the divine will of of God. Hear me. Creation exists only because God has a purpose and a will for his creation. Creation only exists. Creation exists only because God has a purpose and a will for his creation. Many people uh, preach this and say this, uh, that, um, you know, they'll give you an example of, you know, you have breath in your body. Uh, and so that's purpose. I agree with that, uh, but I also disagree because I believe that our purpose far exceeds our life on earth. I believe uh, that our purpose goes beyond our birth date and death date. I believe that God has a way of granting unto us eternal purpose that far exceeds our time stamp here on earth. Hallelujah. God has a way to allow uh, our purpose to far exceed us living and seeing our purpose fulfilled. I believe that God has a way of sustaining our purpose long after our body has been committed to the earth. That's how great and how vast God is. We got to stop boxing him in and saying that he can only use us in life. 
God can use us at any moment, any time, whether we are here and to reap the benefits or see the fruit of the work or not. God has a way of attaching purpose to our existence, not just our life. Hallelujah. God has a way of attaching purpose to our existence, not just our life. We're not at, we're not at a race against the clock. God knows how to use our existence to extract his purpose and his divine will for our existence. Hallelujah. So uh, with Adam, uh, God uh, shows us how he uses his creation, not just with Adam, but with all of his creation. But Adam being the highlight of, of his creation, uh, Adam serves as the archetype of mankind. He serves as the archetype of mankind and at times of all creation. Looking at Adam, we see that God has not turned his creation loose to operate on its own. God has not abandoned his creation. Nor has God given his creation free reign to operate from its own inclinations and emotions. Neither does God rule over creation as an impulsive tyrant, but God sovereignly reigns. He sovereignly rules and governs through faithfulness, patience, and through anguish. God doesn't rule over us as a tyrant would, but God sovereignly rules through patience, through faithfulness, and through perpetual anguish. It's important uh, to note here uh, the great concern that God has for Adam. It's important that we notice uh, the, the concern that God has for Adam. And looking at the concern that God has for Adam, it begs the question for us is, have we considered the precise concern and care that God has towards us? Let's make it personal. Have you considered the care and personal concern that God has towards you? Have you ever considered and taken the time to analyze the consideration of you that God has in his infinite mind. <laughs> Looking at Adam, uh, we get a glimpse of the mind of God concerning us. Look up two points for the text and then I'll be out your way. Uh, Looking at Adam, we get a glimpse of the mind of God concerning us. The first thing he does is he formed man. Formed man. He formed man. Type that in the text box. Shout it out. He formed man. After establishing order in the cosmos, which involved the separation of light from darkness, the development of day and night, the formation of the seas and the dry land, the installation of plants and vegetation, the creation of the animals and the beasts, the creation of the spirit of man in the image of God, God then stoops down. Mama, with his hand, he then scoops up dust. He takes the dust, not the dirt, he takes the dust and begins to form, fashion, shape, mold man according to his own will. God stoops down, scoops up dust, fashions, forms, shapes, and molds man according to his own will. As a potter understands the blemishes 
and limitations of its creation, so does God with his creation. He knows the bumps and the bruises. He knows the nicks and the cuts. He knows the strength and the weaknesses. Type that. Say, God knows me. God knows me. He understands what it is that we're facing. He understands our limitations. He understands our imperfections. He understands every, every part of us that falls short of his glory. Why? Because he created us. He formed us. He fashioned us. I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God is to blame for our imperfections. I'm not saying that God is to blame for our shortcomings, but he understands and he knows our downfalls. He knows the nicks and the cuts. He knows the bumps and the bruises. He knows the strengths and the weaknesses. He knows what to put inside of us and what not to put inside of us. Why? Because he is the potter and we are the clay. He understands his creation. Which means that if we have questions concerning God, God knows how to handle the questions that you have for him. We don't know how to handle it. Pastors and preachers and Christian leaders, we don't know how to handle it. So we tell you don't question God. <laughs> but questioning God and asking God questions is two different things. You're not supposed to question the mind of God and, and second guess the nature of God, but God does not mind you asking him questions. <laughs> he does not mind you asking him questions. We're not to second guess and, and try to circumvent the nature of God and not be sure of the nature of God and the love of God towards us. But God does not mind us asking him questions. It is out of our relationship that we do ask God questions. My faith is strong enough to ask God questions. <laughs> my, my. He understands what we're facing. He understands the language of our teardrops. He understands every blemish that we have. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. You think your infirmity is there just because? You think you're the only one that understands what you're dealing with? You think you're the only one uh, that understands how you're feeling? You may be the only human that understands, but God knows. God understands and he's there to catch you even when you feel like falling. Hallelujah. Have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. Likewise, he also understands the value that can be deposited within his creation. He understands the value that can be deposited within his creation creation, regardless of the blemishes, regardless of the limitations, regardless of the bumps and the bruises, regardless of the nicks and the cuts, regardless of all of that, the creator still finds use of us and places value inside of us. Hallelujah. He places value inside of us. Second Corinthians says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, catch this now. We have this treasure. 
doesn't say that we are this treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Our value is not intrinsic. Our value is imparted. We have this treasure. We possess this treasure. God has given us this treasure. We're not valuable because of who we are. We're valuable because of who God is. Hallelujah. We, are, we, we have this treasure. We take possession of this treasure that God has gifted us. Outside and apart from God, we have no value. We have no treasure. As God spoke to Jeremiah, I believe a generic, uh, or a generic portion, rather, of what he speaks to Jeremiah can, can be applied to all of mankind. Before I formed you in the womb of your mother, I knew you. Before I formed you, before I fashioned you in the womb, I already knew you. We have been on the mind of God and in the mind of God from all eternity. That is why I believe that our purpose far exceeds our birth date and our death date. Because we have been on the mind of God from eternity past. He says to Isaiah in Isaiah 49 and 17, Behold, I have inscribed you upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Continually before me. My purpose exceeds the breath in my body. Hallelujah. God, notice what he does. He, he forms man. Asking this question, what is man? God forms man. Not only does God put his word on man by speaking him into existence, Genesis 1.26, but God then lays his hands on man, Genesis 2.7. He forms him from the dust of the earth. He forms him. God says uh, that I'm not just going to speak to man, but I'm going to take time and put my hand on man. <laughs> Type in the text box, I need a touch from the Lord. Hallelujah. I need a touch from the Lord. Because I recognize that my value, at the risk of repeating, is not intrinsic. But my value is imparted from God. Outside of God, I have no value. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, he did not think I was to die for. Because I had no value outside of him. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm nothing without him. I'm not even dust without him. I don't exist without him. There's no value in me outside of the presence of God. That's why I need a touch from the Lord. I need a touch. I don't just desire a touch. I don't just want a touch, but I need a touch from the Lord. I am in desperate need of a touch from the Lord. Without a touch from God, I have no value. Without a touch from God, I have no life. Without a touch from God, I have no existence. Hallelujah. So he takes man, he forms man. Secondly, finally, he then breathes life into man. So he, he says, let us make man in Genesis 126 in our own image. Then in Genesis 2, 7, he forms man and then he breathes 
the breath of life into man. God now takes the man that he has created, takes the man that he has now formed, and he breathes into him. After the reception of the breath of God, after the reception of the wind of God, man, man becomes a living soul. Only after he has received a touch from God and the breath of God, now he becomes a living soul. Man without the breath of God is lifeless. He has no function. He has no value. But God deposits value into a valueless object and makes it valuable. He deposits value into a valueless object and makes it valuable. Man, at the risk of repeating, by himself has no value. But the breath of God in man gives him his value. That is why it is important to understand that with man by himself, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Man by himself, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Notice he, he breathes into man the breath of life. The wind of God is synonymous in scripture with the spirit of God. He takes the same spirit that we see in Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the spirit of God hovered, moved over the face of the waters. The Ruach of God hovered and moved over the face of the waters in the arche God in the beginning God in the arche theos God the ruach of God hovers over the face of the waters and now he takes that same ruach that same spirit that same wind and he blows it into the nostrils of man and man comes to be whatever God breathes on or breathes into, he gives life to. That's why I believe it's Paul that writes when he says the scriptures are God breathed. Hallelujah. They are God breathed because the scriptures are life. It is a living document, not in the sense of, of a legal matter, but this word is a living word because it has the spirit of God attached to it. So in essence, what God does here with Adam is he takes a worthless creature and gives him value by breathing his spirit into man. Hallelujah. God breathes into man, breathes the spirit into man and he becomes a living soul. He come. He be, he became a living soul. He came to be. Became. He came to be, because he's in the image of God, who's a being. And then, because God gives him his likeness, man comes to be. Hallelujah. Job says in Job thirty three verse four, he says, "The spirit of God has made me, and the breath." of the almighty gives me life. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. How is it that you're able to survive what you're facing? It is because the spirit of God has made you and the breath of the almighty gives you life. How is it that you're able to face everything that you're facing it's because the spirit of God 
has made you and the breath of the almighty has given you life. How is it that you have not thrown in the towel after going through everything that you're going through? It is because the spirit of God has made you and the breath of the almighty gives you life. Why is it that you can stand tall when you feel like crumbling down? It is because the spirit of God has made you and the breath of the almighty has given you life. Why are you still in the ring? Even though you feel like you're about to get knocked out, it is because the spirit of God has made you and the breath of the almighty gives you life. How are you surviving? How are you sustaining? How are you maintaining? It is because the spirit of God has made you and the breath of the and the breath of the almighty has given you life. God has made you and the breath of God gives you life. That's why we can stand tall. That's why we can stand firm. Not because of us, not because of what of who we are, but it's all because of the treasure that God has given us. Hallelujah. It is all because of the treasure that God has placed on the inside of us. It is because like Job said, that the spirit of God has made me. The breath of the almighty gives me life. John records, and I got to hasten to my close. John records a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples after the resurrection. At the close of the conversation. Jesus speaks, he says, he breathed, the Bible says he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. John 20, verse 22. After his resurrection, at the close of the conversation, the Bible says that Jesus breathes on his disciples and says to them now, receive the Holy Spirit. The breath of God is symbolic to the spirit of God. You cannot give up. You cannot throw in the towel. Why? Because the spirit of God is at work in you. Giving up is not in your nature because the spirit of God is on the inside of you. What is man? Man has the spirit of God at work on the inside of us. Hallelujah. <laughs> Why can't you give up? Because there is a finisher that lives on the inside of you. Hallelujah. There's a finisher that lives on the inside of you. And because there is a finisher that lives on the inside of you, you have no right to give up. There's no way for you to give up because the spirit of God is at work within you. And being confident of this very thing that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it, will complete it, will perfect it, until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The breath of God, synonymous, the wind of God, the breath of God is synonymous with his spirit. Acts 2, verse 1 and 2 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. All of us can agree that there was a time in our lives where we were worthless. We had no value. But God took his spirit and breathed the breath of life into us. We got to remember that the value that we have is not intrinsic. It is not natural. It does not come and flows from us because of us. But the value that we have 
has been imparted. It flows from God. Remember that our habitation is not of this earth, but our habitation is from God. When God creates a thing, he speaks to its habitation. When he created the birds, he spoke to the air. When he created the fish of the sea, he spoke to the waters. When he created the land animals, he speaks to, or he spoke to the earth. When he created man, he spoke to himself. Because our habitation is not of this earth. Our habitation is not of this world. Our habitation is not of the, the sun, the moon, the stars, or the water. But our habitation flows from the Spirit of God. Man is created in the image of God, created a little lower than the angels. I ain't got time to deal with that, that word angel. In the original Hebrew, is Elohim. And Elohim is a name for God. <laughs> We're created a little lower than God himself has given us dominion. We are victorious through Christ. Hallelujah. That as we have seen in the archetype of the first Adam, God shows us who we are through the archetype of the last Adam, Jesus the Christ. What is man? What is man? What is man? Man is victorious. Man is an overcomer. Man is an overachiever. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Man is saved when we should have been condemned. Hallelujah. Man is healed of all manner of disease, be it physically or spiritually. What is man? Man is the creation of God. Not only are we the creation of God, but because we have accepted the Lord Jesus, we are joint heirs with Christ. Not only that, we are children of God by, a, by the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry now, Abba, Father. What is man? Man is a child of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We honor you for your transcendence and your eminence. We thank you for forming us. We thank you for fashioning us. We thank you for molding us. We're grateful, God, that you understand every defect, every blemish, we thank you, O oh God, that you understand all of our shortcoming. You understand what's right about us. You understand what's wrong about us. Father, we're trusting in your will. We're trusting in your way. We ask you now that you would continue to place your hand on us. Continue to form us, mold us, shape us into who you want us to be. Form us and continue to breathe into our life to our nostrils, the breath of life. Give us purpose for our existence. We thank you now that our purpose far exceeds our timetable here on earth, but our purpose is eternal. We're grateful for the spirit of victory that you've placed over us. Thank you now in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. May heaven smile upon you. Remember, to continue to believe God. God bless you. A refuge in time.